Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kola Stivala, and I would like to present you this survey on behalf of ADH Europe. ADH Europe represents uh, a platform of about 29 patient support organizations all across the European area. They advocate for people with ADHD, share information, and collaborate on research. If you would like more information, please contact them on the email or have a look at their website. The full survey report is a document of about 55 pages, so I'm going to give you a summary of that, and the full report will be available on the website on our course this evening. The survey is called Diagnosis and Treatment of ADHD in Europe, Survey 2020. The participants were 22 members from 19 countries, Belgium, Croatia, Cyprus, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Iceland, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, Malta, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, the Netherlands, two organizations, and the UK, three organizations. The aim of the survey was to collect information regarding the current situation of ADHD patients in Europe in 2020. It was an update of previous surveys held in 2009 and 2011, or available at the website uh, address mentioned here. And um, there were about 20 questions, qualitative and quantitative, which were reviewed by the board and the professional board. They were sent in Word documents and later in Google form so that we could utilize the graphs and charts. Now the survey, it has limitations. It is based on the information provided by the participating members including that of their health system and pharmaceutical information. In 2020, there are 10 countries now that have a national policy for ADHD. In one, Sweden, the policy is in the making, and in eight countries, there is no national guideline yet, namely Italy, Greece, Croatia, Luxembourg, Malta, Hungary, Cyprus, and Slovenia. The benefit for the patient, if this guideline is in place, is a standard of care. For the countries without a national guideline, we ask if there is a standard procedure that is followed by the professionals. In the blue, we see that 9% does. However, in the red and yellow, we see 36% of the respondents say they receive mixed feedback or that they feel no standard procedure is followed. The explanation for this from the respondents is that their countries have a history of psychoanalytical psychiatry and cultural stigma of ADHD. Most countries have national health services for ADHD. However, France, Italy, Cyprus, and Luxembourg mentioned that their health services cater mainly for those who are diagnosed when they are under the age of 18. In other countries, they refer to specific specialists, such as Greece or Italy or certain locations where services can be held, such as Hungary and Italy. In addition, respondents indicate that the ADHD services are subject to very long waiting lists and are really underfunded to deal with 3-5% of the population that is affected by the disorder. Another complicating factor is that in the UK, Spain, Belgium, the administration and funding is actually done on a regional level. Here you can see in most countries there are private health services for ADHD. Some of the reasons why people would want to use them are shorter waiting lists, therefore a speed of diagnosis, maybe more convenient accessibility, but they can find specialists with ADHD knowledge instead of a generalist in the national system. However, these services come at a cost and all the health systems are very different in the European area. So if you would like to have specific information about the country, you can look in the country profile section. However, from what the respondents mentioned, some of the ways to get a diagnosis range from a cost of 300 up to 1,000 euro. And this would be sometimes partially or completely at cost for the patient. That can be 
a serious stumbling block. According to the gold standard, the UK NICE guidelines, the assessment and treatment should be done by a multidisciplinary team. As you can see in the diagram, the psychiatrist is the one to diagnose a child in all the countries, but they don't all describe it as a team. They describe it as a chain, where the, the specialists don't really have contact with each other. So the family doctor refers to the psychologist, who refers to the psychiatrist, who loops back again to the family doctor for the monthly prescriptions or shared care. And that can also be the prescribing nurse in the UK, Sweden, and the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And then the psychiatrist only has a monitoring visit every six to 12 months. This emphasizes that the GPs should really be knowledgeable about ADHD, as they are gatekeeper. In the last 10 years, international research has shown that ADHD is a lifelong condition. Symptoms start in childhood and 70% continues in adulthood. Other topics of interest have been ADHD in women, their hormone levels, how their characteristics of ADHD may be slightly different than men, and also their medication use might be different. And also emphasis was made on the importance of guiding youths with their transition into adulthood, because early school leavers and addiction lurk around the corner. So for those countries especially, where national guidelines are not in place and where cultural stigma might exist regarding ADHD, these are topics that become problematic with their diagnosis because the specialists are not being held accountable if they do not continuously update their information and their knowledge about ADHD and the medications. This is an overview of the diagnostic tests that are used for children. The psychologist normally uses um, the client patient interview together with rating scales from schools and parents. And after that, often the ADOS with the risk are additionally used to uh, write a report. We see here also the last column, other, indicating that in some countries, uh, such as France and Spain and others, because of their language differences, additional tests are used in their own language. Here are the diagnostic tests used for adults. The procedure for adults, of course, is the clinical patient interview together with rating scales, questionnaires, and interviews. We have to keep in mind that during this decade, the DSM was updated to five and the ICD-11 came out. Um, we see that the DIVA is increasingly used, and still the column for our other tests. And I refer you there to the country profile to see which tests are used in which country. Here's an overview of the professionals that can prescribe ADHD medication for children. It is at 100% the psychiatrist, may be part of the multidisciplinary team of the other specialists, and the GP, and in some countries, the prescribing nurse for the monthly prescriptions. Now, over the last decade, we have seen in the health systems that there has been a digitalization. So in some states, we have an automated system where the prescriber sends a direct uh, prescription to the pharmacy, and that could be for three months or six months, etc. In other countries, uh, that process has not taken place yet and four or five documents are needed on a monthly basis to go and collect the monthly prescription. The professionals that can prescribe ADHD medication are the psychiatrists, some other specialists, and for the monthly prescriptions, the GP and the prescribing nurse. Regarding the cost of the medication, I'd like to refer you to the country profiles because in some countries the medication is completely covered by the national health insurance, in some countries it's partly refunded. If you're interested in this information for the different countries, you can find it in the country profiles. 
Question 16, are there any significant differences reported between the prescriptions in private and national health services? The majority here says no. Another large group says we don't know. Only a few say yes, they believe there are differences. Here we are indirectly referring to the best medication population. Question 17, is there a medicine complaints procedure for the national system? Yes, in the majority of countries, complaints are registered with family, doctors, specialists, or directly to the national agency. Over the last decade, of course, generic medications have rolled out, and in the qualitative responses, the uh, indication was that those especially have been the reason for um, complaints regarding efficacy, regarding side effects, and we feel that's an area where further research is warranted. This is an overview of the different medications available in member states. Medication is a very important tool for the specialist and patient in the toolbox to ensure the best treatment plan for children and adults affected by ADHD and part of their multimodal treatment plan. This list is a tally. So it does not mean that all medications are available in each country. For that, please look at the country profiles. But in summary, there is a lack of medication options and dosages, especially in Greece, Malta, Cyprus, Italy, Hungary, and Luxembourg. And they also mention out-of-stock issues, which is very detrimental to adults at work and children and youths doing exams. If you look at the list, we can see that the generics are represented both in the methylphenidates and in the other. What our members noted is that there is a lack of comparative research on these medications, including the generic brands. The conclusions, there are positive changes. The number of countries with national guidelines for ADHD have increased since 2011. Increased medication brands are available. Increased specialist awareness of ADHD in adults as well as the lifelong condition of ADHD. Circumstances that need improvement. The continued long waiting list for children in most countries, contrary to the nice gold standard advice of early intervention. Inadequate provision of adult services, at a cost to the individual and society for family clinics, unbiased comparative research about the efficacy and treatment of forms from branded and generic medications is necessary. They should also be used in the national medicine procurement systems. There is a lack of access still to the specialists and the lack of medication options. We've also mentioned out of stock situations. And there is a continued cultural stigma amongst the professionals, in the media, and in the general public. The survey shows that despite positive developments, the ideal of a patient, individual with ADHD, being able to access the same standard of care and medication wherever they are in Europe is still very far from reality. ADHD Europe would like to invite you to help to advocate on behalf of children and adults with ADHD for these rights. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and I will be available for any questions you may have.